Today we're going to be taking a look inside of this manual transmission to see what's inside and how it works. Now this transmission is unique because it's out of a B5.5 Volkswagen Passat from about 2002 and that means that the engine is situated longitudinally despite that being a front wheel drive car. You can see this here are the flanges for the axles that would bolt up into it and then the engine would bolt up this way longitudinally under the hood. Now right away you could tell one of the disadvantages to mounting it longitudinally is that you're going to have all the engine's weight in front of the axle which is going to make for a very nose heavy car not very good for handling. However the trade-off in this case is that Volkswagen and Audi we're easily able to adapt this platform to an all-wheel drive setup so you've got your front wheels driven over here and then a tail shaft could run out of the transmission to power the rear wheels in the all-wheel drive or quattro models. Now taking a quick look around this transmission you can see inside of the bell housing there's a lot of clutch material but that's where your clutch would live you can see we've got the fork over here which is the one that's going to be activating that clutch. Down here is that throwout bearing and that sometimes can keep noise when it wears out. Here we've got the input shaft over here and then looking up inside of there you can see this here is the piston that's going to be pushing out that fork against the pressure plate. And coming around to the front here you can see we've got our flange for the axle. This is for the driver's side. You got your output speed sensor over here. Then you got the plug that leads up to your input speed sensor located up here. And here you got the hookups for the cylinder which is what's going to activate and deactivate activate the clutch. Now turning it over on the passenger side here, this is where your axle would bolt up to. You've got a full plug over here and the drain plug down here. There's no particular transmission pan, but you notice that there's these fins here to aid with cooling. Now the gear selector is located off the back here. You can see I can move it back and forth this way. Now since this is still a front engine, front wheel drive car, and it's got an integrated differential, this still can be called a transaxle despite it being situated longitudinally. So we'll start here on the driver's side where there's a bunch of T45 bolts that holds this flange. Now all the way around the tail section of this transmission, we've got a bunch of these bolts here. They're all T45 Torx. Let's see if I can pry this apart here. Got my wife tank tops here. I'm just gonna wipe that up. Okay, pop off that case there. Now taking a look inside of the cover, you can see that all there is is just one counter gear here that spins and it's just attached to the inside casing. Other than that, we just have the seats for the bearings for the tops of these gears here. Now taking a look inside of this transmission, you can see we've got our selector fork over here. Now this fork is allowed to move in and out and it's also allowed to rotate about its own axis. This transmission is actually a little notchy. Now basically what it does is it controls a set of levers down here and that's going to engage and disengage these forks that goes to the synchronizer. Now looking inside of the transmission gear setup here, this axis here is your main shaft and that's powered directly from the crankshaft on the engine. On this side here we have the counter shaft and that's what's going to feed power down to the final drive located down at the bottom here where the axles are. Now ultimately the position of these forks are what's going to engage the gear to drive the counter shaft. And in a manual transmission you have these selector forks which are going to move up and down and that's what's going to select what gear you're in by moving the synchronizing ring over to the gear that you want to select. The gears themselves are always meshed together that way you don't have teeth colliding with each other when you want to change gears. Now this is a five speed manual transmission. You'll note that all of the gears here have an angle cut to them and that's to reduce noise. Now usually the reverse gear in many manual transmissions are just a straight cut and that's why you hear that whirring noise when you reverse but in this case they've also put in a helical gear for the reverse as well. Now taking a look at some of the gear ratios here if you have a small gear turning a large gear then you're going to have a very low gear ratio and high torque which is what you're going to want say in first and second gear so in this case here first gear is this helical gear here that's attached to the input shaft that's going to drive this much larger gear over here on the counter shaft and then go down to the final drive. Now moving up over here the next ratio is second gear which is the this one over here and that's going to take power from here and transmit it over to this gear and if your fork is selected into the second gear is then going to transmit that power down into the final drive. You'll notice that this gear is a little bit larger and this one's a bit smaller than first gear giving you a higher gear ratio so that you can achieve more speed. Moving on now to third gear and you can see that's just above second gear here. Again it is much larger than second gear and this one is much smaller than second gear. Now when the synchronizer moves down, that's going to engage third gears to take power from the input shaft and send it over to the counter shaft and then to the final drive. Meanwhile, first and second gear over here, because this synchro is not either engaged in second or first, is just freewheeling because if they weren't freewheeling, then they'd be contributing to the amount of torque and the gears would grind because they're grinding at different speeds. Now moving up to fourth gear here, 
you can see if I select the synchro over here, fourth gear is a one to one gear ratio and that's why this gear and this gear are now the same size as each other and that's going to carry power through the transmission at a one to one gear ratio from the input to the counter shaft then to the final drive. Next up we've got fifth gear which is this one over here. You'll notice that it is much larger than the gear on this shaft here and that's an overdrive gear which you typically use on the highway where you want your engine to turn nice and slow and efficient but your transmission to spin the wheels really fast. Now this here is controlled by this synchro over here which actually shares it with reverse gear. Now reverse gear which you can see is freewheeling on the counter shaft needs to be connected to the input shaft but not directly and that little gear that we saw inside of the transmission case is going to sit in between here. Now when you run power through another gear it automatically reverses its direction and that's what's going to give you this reverse gear. Now, also note that it's got a similar diameter to first gear over here because reverse is typically used at lower speeds. It also shares the synchronizer here with fifth gear. So all in all this transmission just has three main shift forks over here for third and fourth here for fifth and reverse and here for first and second you can see that this arrangement here also mimics the shift pattern on your shifter knob typically first and second are opposite from each other then third and fourth are opposite from each other and then finally you move the lever over and then up and down for fifth and reverse now the real secret to this shifter working is this little point over here that's actually correlates with it moving up and down now right now I've got it in neutral. You can also move it side to side and you can see how that shifter is going to rotate about its own axis. It's also going to cause this point here to instead of press on the middle part here, press on this side or press on this side. That's all going to activate this lever mechanism. Now each one of those little notches there are going to lead to a shift fork. The bottom one here being for gears one and two. The top one here is for fifth and reverse. And the one in the middle here is for third and fourth. So now we're going to go through each one of the gears so we can take a look at how it works. So for first gear I'm going to move the shift lever over and then pull it up and you'll notice how this one moved down engaging first gear. Now in order to engage second gear I'd still move it over but then push it down and that's what's going to move that fork back up engaging second gear over here. Now for third and fourth gear I don't have to move the shifter sideways just like in your shift lever so I can simply push it down to engage fourth gear and push it up to engage third gear. Now in order to engage reverse I'd be twisting the lever in the opposite direction over here and then pulling up which is what's going to push this fork down to engage fifth. And finally to engage reverse gear again I'd move the shifter back that way and then push down and that's going to move this shifter fork up to engage with this reverse gear here. In order to get the center shaft out, there's a T60 Torx over on this side. And there's also one on the opposing side here. There we are. That's your shifter fork mechanism there. See with that out of the way, you can have one, two and three shifter arms. Moving them up and down is what's going to give you the six selectable gears in this transmission. I'm just going to remove this little mechanism over here. I think this is the thing that has the detents in it. Yeah, this is the thing that moves back and forth. That's what's giving you the detents and the notchy feeling when you shift. So inside of here I found a little secret compartment. Got a little plate on it. I want to see is fluid inside. Now let's take out a couple more bolts from the input shaft section here. Take out that flange. It's got a seal on it. Let's see what happens when I do this. I'll just break the bearing cage out of the way. The reason why they're tapered is because these are helical gears and they're also going to create a force in the up and down direction against the transmission casing. So instead of having just a regular roller bearing, you have something to counteract that force, which is a taper. Let's see what happens when we press this guy off here. Alright, so here we have the bearing race. Here we have the reverse gear. And this is its synchro teeth. Alright, so I can take out this fork release this is the synchro for reverse and fifth gear got a needle bearing on here over here on the input shaft there is the snap ring over here so I'm going to go ahead and use my snap ring removal tool here to take that off and there's a piece of the snap ring there there's the other side of fifth gear and after that one's off this one just slides right off a set of needle bearings just comes off the shaft. Okay, so I released the circlet from the other side and I was able to knock the input shaft loose here. So this is actually the input shaft. Oh shoot, is there a bearing race stuck there? All right, after a lot of prying, I was able to get that axle flange out. You're really fighting this C-clip here as it sticks into the front differential. I 
to knock off this side piece here. And inside this piece here, you have your speed sensor, which is what's going to read the final drive speed through this ring over here. Now over here on the driver's side, I've got the other axle flange. I'm just going to kind of work on it to see if I can remove it. Now if your transmission is leaking, there is a seal inside of here. It's supposed to seal the automatic transmission fluid against this flange over here. Interesting design because other automakers just make this entire flange part of this inner CV shaft. But instead they've actually added this bolt-on feature here to make it easy for you to pop off the axles in case you need to swap the engine or the transmission out really quick. So once the transmission is done shifting through its gears to the input and output shaft here, it's going to go down and drive this front differential. Now I do already have a video on how differentials work, so you're going to want to check that out linked above. But here's what the differential looks like on this car. You can see it's actually housed in front of where the gear changing part happens. And that's how they've made this longitudinal transmission work transversely. And here's something interesting. This is where the input shaft goes down and then down to the bell housing. Now down inside of here you can see that there's actually a circlip. And that's preventing me from pulling this entire thing up and out of the casing. So I'm going to see if I can try to tackle that circlip. I don't know if my angle grinder can fit in here to remove it. You guessed it. I'm going for my snap ring pliers. All right, now we should be okay to pull this guy out of here. You can see this is where the snap ring was sitting. All right, so all that's left is the transmission case, which is a big hunk of aluminum. Now you can clearly see this is where the input shaft would come in. We would change gears up here, and then the output shaft, which has a big large gear, is what would power that differential down inside of here, where it would then go to the axles. Now taking a look at this entire transmission all taken apart here, you can see the general layout. Here we've got the input shaft that's going to come in from the crankshaft to turn this shaft over here, which I call the input shaft. That is in turn going to power the gears over here on the counter shaft. And then that, using this spiral gear over here, is going to turn the large gear on the differential to feed the two wheels in the front. Now if you remember my front wheel drive video, there was a third shaft over here, which ultimately fed the final drive and everything was oriented in the transverse direction. You can see with a longitudinal transmission, everything is in a longitudinal direction until it comes to the differential, which turns the power to work perpendicularly. Now, as I said before, everything on this shaft here and this shaft here are always turning, which means that the gears are always meshed together. And that's going to allow the gears to work harmoniously without grinding any gears. However, you still do need synchronizer. Now, synchronizer is going to work with this fork, which is going to move back and forth in order to change your gear ratio. You can see I've removed the synchro for the reverse and fifth over here, and we're going to have a closer look. Now, this fork here is what's going to move back and forth, but they don't physically move the gears here. They actually move this collar here. Now, this collar here sits in between two gears so for example here's third gear and here's fourth gear and this is the thing that's going to change between those two so right now fourth gear is going to be free spinning on the shaft as well as third gear which means that this is not selected and is basically in neutral now when you want to switch to fourth gear this collar is going to move over this way and that's going to essentially lock this collar which is rotating at the same speed as the shaft with fourth gear here and that's going to therefore engage fourth gear now as long as no other gears are engaged the power is only going to be transmitted through this gear over to the counter shaft everything else is free spinning now taking a closer look at the synchronizer i've taken apart the fifth and reverse gear from over here just so we can see this here is the collar it's going to be connected to this fork here which is what's going to move back and forth Inside of that, we've got this gear here. It doesn't have any teeth, just has grooves on the outside and grooves on the inside. And it's allowed to move back and forth here as this collar moves back and forth. So the inside of here is grooved to fit on top of the shaft here. So whenever this shaft is powered or is rotating, so is this entire collar here as the transmission is turning. Now over on this side, this collar can shift over into the reverse section, or on this side here, the collar can shift over to give you fifth gear, depending on its position. Now here is the collar that's going to be sitting inside of this fork over here, and it's going to move between fifth gear and reverse gear, which in my opinion doesn't even need a synchronizer, but this is just for demonstration. Now when this collar moves to the right, its internal teeth over here are going to be exposed as this collar moves slightly up and that's going to engage with these teeth on the outside here just like that. Now whatever power is being sent through the shaft through these teeth over here is now going to be engaged with this gear over here which happens to be reversed and they can rotate together. Now similarly when this collar moves over it makes room on this side here to engage with fifth gear which is going to slide inside of here and again those two can rotate together along with the shaft and engage the gear. Now the problem arises now is if this shaft here is rotating at a different speed than the gear ratio allows. So for example let's say you're in fourth gear and now you want to go to fifth gear well you need to change the speed from the shaft here to match with the speed of your fifth gear ratio otherwise these teeth are just going to keep grinding each other 
until they eventually engage. Now in order to solve this problem we're going to introduce this brass synchronizer which is going to sit over on the gear itself here. In this case it actually has a return spring but what it does is it's going to form an interface between the gear itself and this fork over here. So when these two are now engaging with each other it first has to engage that synchronizer which is what's going to match the speed of the input shaft to the actual moving speed of the gear first before fully engaging to those teeth. In essence it kind of works like a clutch. This piece in between here which is going to be sitting in here is now going to feel some pressure as the shifter fork is moving it up and that's going to bring it up to speed. Now because the synchronizer itself is also in teeth and because the synchronizer itself is also teethed to the gear itself it's going to start to bring this gear up to speed and then once the gear is fully engaged together it all becomes one unit so in essence you're not grinding it into gear you're slowly bringing it up to speed and then engaging them together to be one unit now as you can see manual transmissions are very reliable there's not too many parts that can wear out besides the synchronizers themselves and obviously the clutch which we saw all that clutch material in the only other thing I can see going wrong is maybe a bearing going out or something getting inside of here causing a lot of wear. And that's pretty much what's inside of a longitudinally mounted front wheel drive transmission. I think it's pretty unique just to see how things are set up in this transmission versus your traditional transversely mounted transaxle. Now make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.